Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we're talking about anti-war activism and a big rally planned for Washington, D.C. We have two guests. Nick Branna is a lifelong resident of Virginia National Chair of the People's Party of the United States. Previously, he was the National Political Outreach Coordinator on Bernie Sanders' 2016 run for president and the electoral manager at Our Revolution. Angela McArdle is the chair of the National Libertarian Party. She joins us from Austin, Texas, uh, and she has been a participant and a winner of a number of debates uh, held at the Soho Forum. So we will be careful about trying to debate Angela. Uh, Nick and Angela, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thanks for having us. Hi, David. Great to be with you. Thanks for coming on. So uh, whoever would like to go first, uh, tell us what is being planned for Washington, D.C. Take it away. Angela, you go. I have to pick. Angela, you go. <laughs> okay. Uh, we have come together and we've, we've joined forces to put together a really awesome anti-war rally at the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. on February 19th. We have got a list of demands that we are uh, asking, asking, demanding Congress uh, do, and uh, like this is this is really spurned by the by the war in Ukraine. We are really concerned with everything that's going on with, with the United States and NATO over in Europe. We have no business in those wars. We have no business instigating something that could turn into nuclear war, and so. We are reaching out to, to join forces and have everybody join us and say that enough is enough. We have got to stand against this. Um, it's not just for us here, right? It's for the good of humanity. Absolutely. Uh, Nick, you second that? What are, the, what are the demands referred to there? Yeah, that's right. We're going to uh, be rallying at the Lincoln Memorial, marching to the White House. Uh, we've got a bunch of other events planned for the weekend, which we can talk about too. Excited to share some of them. We've just added some of them to the lineup. We're turning it into like a whole anti-war weekend of actions. Um, for the for our demands, uh, we came up with a really strong set of uh, 10 demands uh, as the People's Party and the Libertarian Party. And it was amazing to find that we really agreed on all of this on uh, such a strong anti-war position. So we're demanding uh, not one more penny for war in Ukraine. Uh, so stop funding the war, stop sending billions of dollars over um, uh, uh, that should be returned in terms of tax money or, or put into programs that actually help people uh, negotiate peace in Ukraine uh, end the war. Uh, you know, the U.S. obviously sabotaged the peace agreement between uh, Ukraine and Russia uh, back in March and April. Um, so the, the impetus to end this war in Ukraine has to come from the United States. Um, stop the war inflation, the increasing prices, food and gas, energy in particular. Disband NATO. Uh, it should have. Why is it still here? It should have disbanded with the Warsaw Pact. You know, so we should get rid of that. It's just a hostile military alliance waging wars in countries from you know Afghanistan to Libya to uh, to Ukraine now. De, uh, global nuclear de-escalation, uh, because we're on, we've been brought to the brink of nuclear war, a, a nuclear world war, uh, slash the Pentagon budget, cut it in half, abolish the CIA and military industrial complex, uh, abolish war, uh, uh, military industrial deep state, abolish war and empire, uh, restore civil liberties, all the freedoms taken from us in the name of war, and free Julian Assange. Quite a list. I have to say, I agree with uh, every single item. <laughs> I'm, uh, I, I, I worry, though, about the billions of dollars being sent over there because people imagine that that must be doing some good. I, I, I'm not sure much of it makes it outside the Beltway, where the biggest weapons dealers in the world uh, are, and it's actually just weapons that get sent over uh, to Ukraine. Uh, Angela, is that it doesn't most of the money not make it too far from Washington, D.C.? I think there's 
there's that concern. It doesn't make it too far from Washington, D.C. and military contractors. But there's also the concern that I think Whitney Webb has raised on her show that most of the money that gets over there, no matter what form it makes it in, doesn't even make it to the front lines of the war. So we're not even helping the people who are fighting in this war in Ukraine, people who are who are maybe entering into that engagement in good faith or people who've been drafted in and are just forced into it. Uh, that's really concerning as well. And, and I, I think uh, Nick made a point that I think has to be made m many times uh, for people who don't get it anywhere else. Uh, and that is that the, the United States and the UK have been working against ending this war while telling us that they're doing Ukraine's bidding. It's Ukraine that refuses to, yet, to end the war. Uh, what what has been going on in, in terms of resolving this thing? Well, uh, to begin, you, you've got to go back, I think, you know, to the end of the Cold War. And, you know, you could go back further, of course. But then there was a promise made uh, between uh, the Bush senior administration, and the Gorbachev administration, not to expand NATO in exchange for essentially dissolving the Soviet Union, reunifying Germany. Um, that's a promise that has that. Uh, the United States, every single U.S. president has broken uh, more than doubling the size or doubling the size of NATO, bringing it right up to Russia's border. For decades, Russia has told us that Ukraine, which of course is right on uh, Russia's border, is a critical security concern. They can't have uh, nuclear weapons placed there. They can't have weapon systems placed right there on their border that could strike Moscow, that could strike major cities of theirs you know, uh, potentially before uh, they have the chance, uh, before they have a warning, before they've had the chance to fire retaliatory strikes, you know, so it's essentially the United States trying to give itself this um, terrible advantage in mutually assured destruction uh, and, and in the kind of arms race by placing weapons there. Um, so, and then of course there was the coup in 2014 uh, that the United States uh, uh, instigated uh, on a democratically elected government in Ukraine, installing uh, instead a, a pro-Western, pro-NATO government. Uh, there was the shelling of the Donbass for the following eight years. And really, that's when the war began. It began with the coup in 2014. This is really the ninth anniversary of the war. Um, and then, of course, there was, a, a, ironically, Zelensky who ran in a peace, a platform of peace. Uh, but then the uh, the, the, the Nazi elements that are in Ukraine's military uh, threatened to assassinate uh, uh, Zelensky if he went through with that and if he actually ended the conflict in the Donbass that, uh, that, that laid the groundwork for the crisis where it is now, the war where it is now. So over and over and over again, the United States has been instigating and pushing this war. And now we know because of Angela Merkel's uh, in incredible revelation that in fact, the West, NATO, um, the United States have always intended and planned for a conflict, a war with Russia, and that the Minsk agreement um, that was supposed to bring peace in Ukraine uh, and, and provide autonomy to those Eastern regions was in fact just a stall tactic uh, to allow the West and NATO and the United States to militarize Ukraine, weapons, training, um, for that eventual war with Russia. And of course, the challenge now is that because the U.S. Uh, and NATO have proved that they're so duplicitous in the war and in the you know, uh, agreements that they negotiate, there's, it, it makes it very difficult to come to the table and imagine that they're going to negotiate any kind of peace in good faith. It's, it's incredible to me that this war is in the name of democracy and self-determination when if the people of Crimea, who would have voted to join Russia at any time in the past century, and uh, and, and nobody's proposing a revote because they know exactly how it would go, were allowed to, to do what they wanted, or if the people of the Donbass were allowed the autonomy that they were supposed to have under the Minsk agreements, then, then there wouldn't have been this conflict? Am, am I nuts here? No, I think that's pretty correct. When we think about democracy uh, and, and wanting to bring democracy to the region, we should think about it in terms of what that really means through the American military lens. It means our version of democracy, uh, which is uh, having the United States special interests 
at the forefront of all agreements. And so we want them to think about, uh, oh, democracy, that means American and NATO influence and whatever we need over there. Uh, it's not about the will of the people in Ukraine who are unfortunately just pawns in this horrible, horrible conflict. Uh, it's certainly not about the will of the Russian people. It's not about keeping peace even. And I would like to think that that would be at the forefront of everyone's minds who's in involved in this nightmare scenario, but it is, it is definitely not. Uh, as we see them push closer and closer to maybe the brink of nuclear war. I, I'm very much, uh, I'm very grateful that I've been asked to uh, come and speak uh, at this rally at, on February 19th in Washington, DC. Uh, and when I speak, I speak against both sides of every war. Um, and there are a great many people uh, who think one should only speak against the Russian war making and a great many other people who think you should only speak against U.S. war making in support of Russian war making. Which, uh, <laughs> which side of the war do you all oppose? Uh, I'm just opposed to war. You know, uh, do you know what I'm most opposed yeah. to? I'm, a, I'm most opposed to the United States involvement in this war. I'm opposed very strongly to our invisible hand in this conflict. For all of the reasons that um, that I mentioned earlier, that you've mentioned, Angela's mentioned, the United States laid the groundwork for this crisis. And I think that as much as we want to, uh, you know, I think obviously anybody who wages war uh, is, that's something that needs to be condemned. That's something that costs human lives. But we also have to understand that um, if you are threatening someone's vital interest, holding a gun up to their head, you know, eventually there is going to be a reaction. And so I think that, you know, if you want to trace the, the kind of causality of what's behind this war, time and time again, it comes back to this hegemonic notion of global control and imperial control that the United States has committing us to wars, you know, in Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Libya, you know, all over the world. Um, I, I, I think it comes back to that. So what is the what is the website? What is the name of this rally? And, and what do people do if they want to learn more, get involved? And, and, and how is how is the planning going in terms of turning people out for this thing? Planning is going really well. It's going nonstop. Uh, we have planning calls every single day. <laughs> We're promoting it aggressively. I'm really hyped about that. We've got uh, bus routes that are going to be picking people up for within about a four hour drive radius of the event. So if you're out there and you're thinking, oh, I'm in New York City or I'm in Baltimore, Maryland, and I can't make it. Yes, you can. We can still have you. Um, we want to have you and and we're going to be helping you get there. And what is the website? What is the name of the event? How do people find out about it? Rageagainstwar.com. Uh, um, so come join us because it's really exciting. It feels like a resurgence in the anti-war movement, um, you know, because hundreds of thousands of people protested Vietnam. They protested Iraq, you know, but here we are on the brink of nuclear war, uh, really in, in what we, you know, consider a, a world war already, at least at the People's Party, we think this is already a world war. The Ukrainian defense minister abandoned the pretense. They said, we're fighting on behalf of NATO. When we, when we make a strike, when we make a tactical decision, a strategic decision on the battlefield targeting, it comes from NATO. The, you know, the war is being won by NATO. The only thing that, you, the only kind of you know, break from a full on NATO war is that the soldiers, the cannon fodder, are Ukrainians. And so um, this is really a, a NATO against Russia and Russia's allies, Iran, China, uh, Saudi Arabia increasingly. Uh, a world war, and it's a war. It, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of like the frog in the boiling water, right? It's like, uh, you know, there's escalation after escalation after escalation. But because we haven't drafted people in this country, because the war isn't being fought in Virginia, you know, it's you know, it's easy to kind of tune out. Um, but uh, uh, as as I think the the uh, the guys on the Duran said, um, you know, if we don't break from this course. Uh, uh, through, you know, mass protests that pulls, uh, especially the United States away from that, we're going to get these escalations. We're going to get, now we're training Ukrainians. Now we're deploying the 101st Airborne. 
you know, to the border. Now they're crossing the border into Ukraine. You know, now now uh, there's a, a, a world war, you know, or now there's a missile that lands in Poland, you know, that that threatens to widen the conflict. Now Poland is potentially considering invading Western Ukraine. We're, you know, now, OK, now there's tanks being sent. That wasn't being done before. Patriot missiles. You know, we're going to get this escalation upon escalation upon escalation. And then, as they said, and I, you know, I agree, uh, something dramatic is going to happen. Um, you know, potentially somebody's going to test a nuclear weapon again. Uh, I, I'm not sure what it is, but it's going to shock everybody. Um, and and it could be immediately, you know, it could, it could be an accident, a rogue provocation, anything that takes us from where we are to a nuclear war in a matter of hours. And that's what's so dangerous about when you walk right up to the line of annihilation. It, it does seem crazy to me that at the point of the greatest risk of nuclear apocalypse, we wouldn't have lots of bigger anti-war rallies than with wars that don't have that same risk of destroying all life on the planet. And when you have both big political parties in Washington, D.C. supporting a war, you'd think we should have a bigger anti-war presence than when you have only one of them <laughs> supporting a war uh, or, you know, one of them primarily supporting a war. Uh, Angela, do we have our do we have our priorities right in this regard? I think that people have been, especially over the last three years, disincentivized to speak out and share their political views. The country is very tribalized. People are very pitted against one another, left versus right. Everything that you say on social media Everything is politicized. Everything is a signaling mechanism. Even diet is politicized. This war is heavily politicized. And I think that's one of the great things about having the Libertarian Party and the People's Party come together and hold this rally because we're, we represent, you know, like independent sector. We represent people who are not shackled to the, to the left-right paradigm in that strict sense. We're not Republicans and Democrats. And we're saying it's okay to speak out against this. Uh, we'll be the ones, we're like the shield, right? You know, we'll take the, the brunt of the PR abuse. You come out and support us and we can all join forces together and say that, hey, you know, there are a lot of Americans who don't believe this is the right thing to do. Um, it takes courage, but I think now is a better time than ever to be courageous. It, it, it also takes being willing to meet with and work with people you disagree with on a lot of other issues, right? I, I mean, I, yeah. I want to oppose war with whoever opposes war, right. not, you know, my priority isn't avoiding being near people I, I disagree with on other topics. Uh, this is, is, an, is, is, this is an, a, it's an existential threat. It doesn't matter if you disagree on, you know, what J.K. Rowling said on the Internet or or even economics, if we've all been blown apart in in nuclear war or died of starvation in nuclear winter. This is the number one issue that everyone should be able to come together on. I am yeah. inclined to agree, but it's a big hurdle, isn't it, Nick? I mean, I'm I just for being part of this upcoming event, February 19th, the Rage Against War, uh, I, I'm being accused of all sorts of things because there will be people there that I disagree with on other topics. This is the, uh, this is the, I think the old paradigm of organizing the anti-war movement. And part of the reason that as an anti-war movement, we haven't been able to bring out as many people as we need to fundamentally challenge the war machine. And that is that we've siloed ourselves off. We've siloed ourselves into, you know, we can only work with people who happen to agree with us on every single other issue. Uh, and so when you do that, you know, then you're turning away so many different allies. I mean, one of the advantages, like Angela just described, we have a big advantage now in opposing war, that it's, it's not just the left that was mostly out protesting the Vietnam War, mostly the left protesting, you know, the Iraq War. And those were, you know, kind of partisan aligned wars. So that's different, you know, because there was one party who was more opposed to it, especially during the Iraq war. Um, but now, you know, we have both parties who are 100, you know, almost 100 percent like on board uh, the, the war train. And we have people on the left and the right and across the political spectrum who are against the wars, people who are offended by, you know, the, the constant multi-billion dollar aid packages that are being sent in weapons, you know, time and time again, you know, while there's people who are homeless, they don't have enough to eat in this country, they don't have health care, you know, they don't like, they, they don't have, and they see their communities 
are themselves, they're deteriorating. They've lost their jobs that have been, you know, outsourced for decades. And they're seeing Congress, you know, Congress parade Zelensky in as a celebrity. Here you go, billions of dollars, weapons. Like you said, it all just goes to the beltway. You know, it's just a big military, industrial, corporate welfare operation. And then, of course, the members of Congress, they get their kickbacks. You know, they outperform the stock market always. You know, how do they do that? Wow. Um, so meanwhile, people in this country are hurting. They're insulted by that. And so I think more and more people are attuned and we would be foolish to silo ourselves off and say, I'm not going to work with you because you don't have this other view that I have in this other area. We can all agree that indiscriminately killing people abroad and using our resources for that rather than to provide for people is, is a bad thing. We are speaking with Nick Brana, chair of the People's Party, and Angela McArdle, chair of the National Libertarian Party. Uh, so it, the, the website, Angela, is uh, rageagainstwar.com, and there are multiple events, I take it, not just the one rally? Yes, we're putting together a film screening. We're putting together a day of action in Congress once once the doors are open again after President's Day weekend. We're going to have a reception afterwards. It's going to be an incredible opportunity to meet people and engage with, with people across the political spectrum where you thought otherwise you had nothing in common with them. It turns out we have a lot more in common than we ever thought. So this, so the 19th of February is a Sunday, and so the following day will be a Monday and a work day, and, and activities will happen then as well? That's right. A lot of people have the day off because it's President's Day. We're going to be out celebrating um, the warmongers of history. So why not come to, to our event, do that, take the day off, and do some meaningful political action? Uh, and, and people who want to get on a bus or carpool or otherwise figure out a way to get to the distant capital of this imperial uh, gargantuan state we are part of can go to the website and, and check it out. That's right. We'll have uh, bus routes up shortly. You can hit uh, contact. You can contact us through the website. If you have any additional questions, we'll get you on that list. We're trying to set that up uh, so that it's all wrapped up within a week of the event. But uh, I'm sure we're going to be able to make room for everybody because the more people who are joining, the more buses we're adding, the more drivers we're getting. It's really exciting. Yeah. What about what about solidarity events in other locations for people who just can't make it two or 3,000 miles to D.C. the way, I, you know, I'm always <laughs> jealous of how easy it is to bring everybody to London or Paris or Rome. Uh, but this is a big place. Uh, do you support people doing their own events uh, if it's just too far? We do have one satellite event set up right now that's happening up in the Seattle, Washington area, the Libertarian Party, and I believe the Washington uh, Green Party are, are working on an on, an, on a satellite event up there, but we are encouraging as many people as possible to join us in DC. We'll also be live streaming. So if you're, uh, if you've got mobility issues, you can't get around, you know, it's a serious budget constraint, you'll be able to watch. Terrific. Um, there's a, there's a growing list of speakers. Um, Nick, who are, who are some of the speakers? Yeah, we've got a great group of people joining us. You'll be there. Um, oh, we've also got, uh, Jimmy Dore, uh, Medea Benjamin, uh, Scott Borden, uh, Garland Nixon, uh, Daniel McAdams, who's the executive director of the Ron Paul Institute, uh, Max Blumenthal with the Gray Zone, uh, Anya Perrinfeld with the Gray Zone, Supreme with the Wu-Tang Clan. Uh, super excited. I really hope he performs. Uh, Tara Reed, uh, Diane Sayre, uh, Scott Ritter, uh, Kim Iverson, Jackson Hinkle, and Matthew Ho. Uh, and we expect that, uh, uh, I think, you know, I think we're also going to have Pasa Jarjula joining us. So excited uh, about that, that group of folks. It's quite a mix of wonderful people uh, who, as we've said, disagree on a lot of things. Um, and it's it, it, it's great to have agreement on cut the Pentagon budget in half. Uh, you know, you'd think we could always all agree on that, uh, even if some of us want that spent on human and environmental needs and globally, not just nationally. And some want it spent just nationally and some don't want it spent at all. 
uh, you'd think that everybody could agree on not spending it on organized mass killing, risking life on Earth. But it seems, right. seems a rarity to me. And, and I think right. you have to put that figure in perspective. Um, you know, so the the military budget that was just approved $858 billion for 2023. Uh, that is half of the federal discretionary budget. Uh, also, it is it is bigger than the next nine military budgets, next nine countries combined. Also, the amount that we've sent to Ukraine outside of that $858 billion uh, Pentagon budget, just the, the $115 billion sent to Ukraine through these additional expenditures is more in and of itself than Russia's entire military budget for a year. And on top of that, You've got the fact that the Pentagon has been audited. It's failed five consecutive audits. And the last one found that it can only account for 39% of its $3.5 trillion in assets. What other business or agency would, would be allowed to do that? To only account for 39% of, of, of $3.5 trillion? Where's the other 61%, the other $2 trillion? Where is it? Excellent question. Uh, two minutes left, uh, Angela. What should what should people know uh, who who have not been paying enough attention? Why should people Why should people arrange to get to Washington D.C. Uh, for February nineteenth, Rage Against War? Come down and rage against war with us on February nineteenth at the Lincoln Memorial. We have an incredible opportunity to send a really powerful message right now when uh, support for the presidency is at an all-time low and we may be getting in a new president uh, in a very kind of unprecedented move for the last uh, several years of history. We may have we may not have a two-term president. We may get someone totally different. It's going to be really interesting. Um, the time is ripe. You've got left-right coalitions. You've got independent uh, political sectors rising to the top and spreading a message of peace. Most of all, I'd say this is a peaceful rally. This is a peaceful movement. We are we are fighting back against war because we think that humanity can do better. And that should be the United States role if we're going to be involved. Very good. Uh, Nick, minute left. What, what do you say? I would say this is our chance to stand up uh, against the military industrial complex, the deep state. Um, we all know that in this country is not really a democracy. It's a sham. Um, really, we are governed by this collection of military industrial interests. They drag us from war to war. We don't really have any say in the matter. They even override uh, the president and the elected government uh, when, uh, when it's convenient to them. Um, there was uh, talk about pardoning Julian Assange and Snowden in the Trump administration. The CIA and the Pentagon came back and said no. And said, oh, well, oh, I guess you can't. You know, so we don't really have an elected government. It's a facade. Um, and so we have to, this gets to every other issue on top of the threat of annihilation, nuclear annihilation. And so we have to stand up. This is our chance to stand up. This is our chance to show that there is a resistance in the United States, that we aren't just going to put up with this, that the military and the Pentagon don't have carte blanche to slow walk us into a third world nuclear war. And so, you know, that that's going to happen by people coming out in 1971, 500,000 people descended on Washington, D.C., surrounded the White House, convinced Nixon not to drop atomic bombs. Yep. It can have an impact and it must have an impact. So yeah, really, uh, everyone who's out there, please join us in Washington, D.C. if you can. Thank you, Nick Brenna and Angela McArdle. Thank you for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you, David. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.